Um, all right, remember that we got into all of this thing because we actually was thinking about merge. And we learned to merge uh, linked lists. Remember how we merged linked lists? Uh, and I introduced this thing called go to. We all were sort of, oh, you were away, so you didn't see go to. You watched the video, so you saw go to. So uh, today I'm going to teach you some other bad programming practices because uh, it's always pleasant to introduce techniques which are known to be bad in general when they're good in particular. So uh, the problem which we're going to address today, and that's we're going to go in a funny way about things. Sort of the normally when I teach about merge, I say, well, we learn to do linked list merge, but in reality, people don't do linked list merge. We need to learn merge, which sort of merges things. And we'll look at that, and then eventually we discover uh, that we could use it for sorting, and we come up with merge sort, and then we realize that merge sort needs extra memory, and we say, oh, it's very unfortunate. Couldn't we find merge sort, which does not require extra memory and things like that. Uh, and this time around, I decided to follow a different path. We're not going to, at first, look at normal merge. And we're not going to look at normal merge sort. We're going to start with writing very beautiful, but somewhat slow code. You say, well, but we don't want to. Yes, you don't want to write slow code. But sometimes it's actually good to start with a slow code and then refine it into a fast code, uh, especially if it allows you to sort of create something architecturally nice and see connections. You know, life is such. So what we're going to look at, we're going to look at first at a much harder problem, the problem of regular merge. We're going to look at the problem of in-place merge. There's a function in STL incorrectly called in-place merge. Why is it incorrectly called? That was Paul's discovery. That was incorrect name for in-place merge. And he discovered it while working on an index to our book. He discovered a general principle which escaped me for decades. I'm not joking, it's a very important principle for naming. In-place merge is a bad name for a function. The name should start with merge. The name should start with merge. Why? If you sort it alphabetically. It should come next to merge in the index. Because people who look at the index are not going to look at merge and all its versions. And of course, you say, Alex, aren't you a total idiot? I guess. I did not see it till Paul discovered it when uh, we were working on the book at around 2005. So for like several decades, I was blissfully calling functions in place merge because that's how we say it. Important thing, when we look at the names, this is I'm just emphasizing a very important naming principle. Think about indexing things, you know, like, if it's find, find should be a first thing. It should be special find. It should be find special. It should be find if, not if find. Do you see what I mean? It should, you should arrange things. You should sort. Root should be first, and then suffixes should be sorted in the order of importance, which, which is a difficult thing. But it's a major, major thing. Again, a lot of work which I spend, it's naming functions. I don't know about you guys. But it's, it's an important thing. Because my natural desire, of course, to name a function what? Nick knows. Foo. Of course, I want to name it foo. But it's actually not acceptable, guys. Even if I name it foo one, foo two, foo three, I, you know, people have difficulty, including me. They will sort together, that's for sure. But not in a distinct way. You know. So 
so finding good names is very important. This is why I'm talking about this principle of naming. The root, the one around which you group things, should be first. So in place is a, so couldn't we look at the file called merge? Uh, actually, don't. Don't, not yet. Let's talk first. Then we'll look. So the problem is actually hard if you start thinking about it. First of all, let us figure out what's the interface. And interface is not trivial because, you know, normally you talk about merge, you have this range, that range, and then you sort of merge them into some other range. Obviously, if you have range here and range there, it's very hard to merge them in place because they sort of disjoint. So the, the interface for in-place merge assumes that merges are adjacent. That what we have, we have first merge, uh, first range, followed by the second range. What's the precondition? Sorted. By sum, we have some relation which sorts them. And what, what do we want to accomplish? Create, no. In place means we want this big range to be sorted. Right? Of course, there is seemingly a very simple way of doing in place merge. Yes, that's the word. Copy everything out of No. It's even simpler. It's really in place. It's just sorted. Ignore the fact that they're already sorted. Just sort the whole big thing. It will work. Uh, there are problems. I mean, one interesting problem is that if you use sort, which is not merge-based sort, after you sort, stability will be lost. And one of the sort of things which we want for merge is that it's stable. And the reason we want it to be stable because we eventually want to use it in sort, which is stable. Stable sorting is the thing after which we're sort of heading. We want to sort because otherwise sorting seems to be easy. Tony Ho invented this beautiful algorithm called quick sort, which sorts things. However, it's not stable. So uh, the, 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 the interface is simple. So we're talking about uh, merge sort. And we have two adjacent ranges. Could we make them counted ranges? Okay. So for if they're not, if they're not, if they're bounded ranges, the interface will take three iterators, first, middle, last, yeah? And precondition is first, middle is sorted, and middle last is sorted. But as we shall see, again, these are not questions which I'm asking because I want to say, oh, you know, we need counted ranges. In reality, the algorithm which we will look at will greatly benefit if we have counted ranges. By the way, which probably will give you a clue what we're going to be using. When do we need counted ranges? When we need bisection, when we're going to be using something like binary search. So what is a good interface for, for uh, this, this kind of thing? That's one big thing. Yes, another way which I sort of use, which we could argue, is that we have F1 N1 followed by F2 followed by N2. There are two counted ranges. And of course, we have a precondition that this is sorted, and this is sorted. We could write it. 
that you have is sorted for content. And we have an additional precondition. Yes. How good would I it? Uh, yes, except it might not quite work. What kind of iterators are these? They don't have to be random access. And if they are not random access, minus will not work, right? So how would we write? But you are very close. No, we don't need to say that. Say the distance from here to here is equal to to this. That's that's effectively what it means. They're adjacent. That the distance, whether whether you count or whether you move, it's the same. It's the same thing. So that's the the precondition. So we have. Let us look at the problem. The problem is hard. Sort of. It's spent. You know. I spent many years thinking about it, long, long time ago. And the solution. This is another sad story. You heard about the fish, right? Uh, another sad story of my life is the story of finding this algorithm. Now, you know, this is a notoriously hard problem. Many people worked on it, and the first solution was done by a Russian computer scientist, Kronrod, but it wasn't stable. Then there was a solution worked by a, a wonderful American Argentinian computer scientist. Uh, Luis Pardo, new student. Uh, but it was again sort of difficult. And, and I was thinking and thinking and thinking. And once I was waking up in this phase between, you know, twilight when you wake up, you still see dreams, but you're not quite asleep. I saw the algorithm on the board. It does happen to actually happened to me several times. And it was this algorithm. Oh, I was ecstatic. I think it was 1984, say, long time ago. And I was so ecstatic. I, what do you do if you find a really beautiful algorithm? What would you do? I call my friends. Okay, So at that time, you do not know, but Paul knows. Who was my best friend? 1984. Dave Master, of course, yeah. So he was a professor at RPI. So I called him and said, look, Dave, this is absolutely gorgeous. And you'll see it is absolutely gorgeous. And I explained it to him. And he says, oh, it's absolutely gorgeous. And you know, I start implementing and doing measurements and all of that. In the meanwhile, he goes and tells his faculty members around him about this new beautiful algorithm Alex dreamt. And uh, here comes the bad news. Uh, one of his colleagues, Eric Kaltofen, who is a very distinguished specialist in uh, algebraic algorithms, computer algebra, after Sometime comes to Dave and says, yeah, yeah, very nice algorithm. There are these two Polish guys which published it two years ago. And that was, of course, also very sad because you think it you know, happens to me all the time. We, we often reinvent things. There were two Polish guys, uh, Zudzinski and Didek, who published it. But in the meanwhile, Knuth met his friend, von Pratt, who told him, about this algorithm. So he gives the attribution to his friend, ignoring two Polish guys. But two Polish guys, for all I know, are the guys who invented it. And it is a very beautiful algorithm indeed. And while as an algorithm itself, it's utterly useless. This is this. If you just do it, we could modify it into something practically very, very important. Sometimes. Algorithms published by theoreticians could be used by us after appropriate modification. I'm sure you believe that, at least in general. So let us look at the problem. So the problem is that you have two guys, like so and like so. 
and you want to merge them. And all of us know that if you don't know how to do it, what you want, you want to find some divide and conquer. That's an old thing. So how could you divide and conquer? And here comes that beautiful idea. They say, let us take a middle of one guy. Is it possible to find a middle? Just the middle. So we will bisect one of the guys. That's the guy here. Now, after we bisected this guy, and let's assume, let's ignore the relative lengths, by the way, just for the time being. The time being. So we pick one guy. And then we take this guy and we say, oh, where would it fit into this sequence if we could find it? Do we know how to, to see where it would fit? Do we have a function? Now we do. Not partition, but partition related function. I would say upper bound would work really well. So we'll use upper bound to see how this guy fits into this range. Uh, now I need to, to draw it a little bit because it's going to fit here, if you see what I mean. At this, at this level. So now, and we did relatively few comparisons. Log n. So now what could we do? And here comes another insight. That if we have guys here, if we look at this like here, then if we take this guy and rotate him around with this guy, then we get a picture of this guy who remains in place, then smaller guy from here, uh, which gets here, then it would be this guy followed by this guy. Do, do, do you see what I mean? No. I'm just deleting this so that only the new stuff So somehow, if we don't bother about the cost of rotate, and let's not for a second, we were able to reduce the thing to a much smaller half, approximately, problem. Right? So if we could do it, of course, sort of doing it correctly requires several, several tricky things. One thing we need to realize that if we are dealing with s smaller range in terms of size followed by larger range, which range should we bisect? Smaller one, because we want to get to an empty range as quickly as we can. So we always speak. Then, if the smaller one is on the left, what kind of function should we use? We should use lower bound. If it is on the right, we should use upper bound. Why? Because you see, we found a guy in the middle. What we absolutely do not want, we do not want him to jump over his equal guys here. That would be bad. So we need to assure that whichever way we go, we do not jump. Therefore, we, when we go this way, we use lower bound. When we go this way, we use upper bound, which would assure that, that uh, we never cross equal elements. Equal elements will not travel past because what we know is that when we're looking for lower bound, the guys here, none of them will be equal to this guy. Right? So when we rotate, some of the guys equal to him could, could get ahead, but that's all right. 
as long as equal guys do not cross each other. Right? So let us look in, in that the problem here, of course, which Paul and I had to face here, the, the great contribution, which is like al almost as evil as go to, uh, credit goes to both me and Paul. Because what we realized is the following thing. That if we, you write a function like that, has to return a lot of stuff. You start with two ranges, and then you end up with four ranges. Now, if you end up with four ranges, you have to return just oodle of stuff. And here comes the solution, which we're quite proud. That is, while we strongly urge you never to do it, that is, returning things through a reference argument. Sometimes it's really nice. That is, what I'm trying to say that all the things which they teach you of not to do, you have to exercise with like judgment. If it leads to better code, do it. Whatever it is, go to returning things through reference arguments. Whatever works, the goal is simplify the code. Right? So here we have to go to merge in place. And these are two guys. Uh, this is my, by the way, talking about Dudzinski. This is Polish N with uh, apostrophe on top, which softens any people who speak Polish. Nobody speaks Polish. OK. As far as I know, sounds something like Dudzinski. But so these are the guys who pu published it. And uh, in 81, before I dreamt of it, so maybe it was like you know, the fact that it appeared in, in a magazine was somehow affected my dream. So uh, and here, what I decided to do, ah, fuck. I spent so much time indenting it. And by using inferior editors, all the indentation disappeared. I don't know what I got there, but it looked indented. So of course, what I mean that all these things, what do we start with is with two ranges which are given. Could, could you go up so that we see the full signature? So let us stop, stop, stop. Just let's look at the signature. So what I do is this is a function called merge in place. This is our main function. And then left subproblem. This is an improvement on AOP. But there it was called merge in place one. And I think left subproblem is much clearer. What is the left subproblem, by the way? It's when the smaller guy is on the left. Right. So, uh, what I have, I have two ranges given as input, passed by value, and then four ranges which I'm going to return. They're uniformly named. So, you know, F, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and the same for N. And Again, here it became very clear that trying to use first wouldn't work. It has to be F. When you have indices, old mathematical one character names are very good. So we have four ranges. Again, what are precondition? STD distance means we're from F1 to it's N0. That's the one which we found. And is sorted this and is sorted that. Now, what do we do? Well, this we, we didn't, I didn't really need to return the beginning of the first out of the four subranges. We know it's going to be F0. But for symmetry, I'll just return it. So, and I return it. Then I find the half of the first subrange, yes, midpoint. Then I move, uh, I, then I f find the half the distance, 
and then I moved by advance to that point, which is going to be F01. This is the, this point. Okay. Let us, let us do it here on the, on the board. So these are two things which are given to us F0, uh, zero, F1, and 0 is the length, and 1 is the length. Right? So what I do first, since this is smaller, I find half of that and then move the, this, this. This becomes my F00. Zero, zero. This becomes my F01. Right? Then what I do. I find F11 F11 because that's this thing is not going to move so this is the so I find F11 using lower bound to preserve them crossing. Everybody follow? Now, it comes to something, and here I have to tell you, it will not work with old compilers. It will work only with new compilers and new STL of C++11. I'll explain why. Because we need to use STD rotate. We're rotating from here to there, F1, and up to here, to show you, right? We rotate it. The sad fact here, I have to tell you a sad story. Uh, when I put a rotate in STL, it returned void. In 1995, I discovered that it should, and figured out how it, what it should return and how to do it efficiently. Which is when you rotate, you want to s return where the new middle is. Because that's typically what people want. For yes. Therefore, SGISTL and all my lectures, and it took, again, literally 20 years for this thing to come up with the standard. I thought it was in some. What was the intermediate thing done in 2000 something one? Uh, to 2003, there was the uh, tier one. I thought they fixed it in tier one, apparently not. So you have to use new, new rotate, or I'll tell you how to quickly fix it if you like. You need to wrap old rotate and then just advance sufficiently far. So. Uh, and return it, but uh, I don't want to implement rotate now in the class. We might do it some other day, but it would be ridiculous. So we rotate. Now we find the distance between whatever. This is the guy, by the way. After we rotate, it returns sort of the this. It returns this plus the length of this. Right? Let's see, here. So that becomes our F10. Uh, so we already have all the Fs after the rotate. But we need to figure out what's the distances. And then we cheat. What we say, well, but now finally we know that one guy is in its final destination. It's the same, you know. This guy, when we rotated him, we know that he reached its final destination. 
because there is nobody who could, who could move him. So what we do, we say, well, we don't really need to, uh, to uh, To look, to look at, at, at him again. So, this we we moved by by one more one more uh, one more step. That's what we do here. And if Ryan will permit, we figure out the length. It's, it's not that complicated. One could handle it. So it's binary search followed by rotate. Now, of course, what we need to do is, I mean, we solve left subproblem. So we need to solve right subproblem. Anybody wants to, to guess what will change? We will use upper bound, and there will be slight difference in the calculations of, of, of these things. But it, it's going to be basically the same code. So you have to stare. I mean, here I, I try to explain, but it's, it's complicated enough that you have to internalize it. And th there is a path to internalizing, as we'll, you'll see very shortly, because, uh, OK, as you sh will see very shortly. So let us just, before we, before we run out of time, which again is usually I run earlier than I. So merge in place. No, where is where's the right sub problem? Or you were on the right sub problem. So on the right sub problem, the fundamental difference is that we do upper bound. And we skip the guy on, on the other side. And uh, uh, we do rotate. So it's, it's a very similar code. Isn't there another precondition here that, uh, that F1 is non-empty? Because we are incrementing. Uh, yes, there is a precondition. We shall see if the precondition will be clearly written in the place where they're called. Yes, 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 yes. We need to put a precondition that both ends are greater than zero. Yes, please. Otherwise, we will get in trouble. But as you will see, this precondition will be satisfied in the caller function uh, in both places. Uh, no, 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 no. N0 and N1. N0, the first two guys. The input ranges. N0 and N1. Like that. Because the other guys are out parameters. We don't have like an ADA. We cannot say out. But these are not guys given to us. These are guys which we're going to compute. They're out parameters. OK. And now comes the, this wonderful function, which actually does the uh, merge in place. So what does it do? It says that. If either one is 0, get out. You are done. They merged. If this on this side or this on this side is 0, you are done. Whatever is there is merged. Everybody follows? Now, then we create, and again, my rule is never use constructors like that and followed by a bunch of variables. Do one at a time. Now, it's a very good rule, except when it doesn't work. So here, of course, I list. These are f f four iterators for the beginning of the ranges, 
and four integers. They, I just declare them. I'm going to populate them. And then I say that if left is smaller than right, it could be less or equal, by the way. But that's one more character. That's why, I mean, that's the only reason. So you, you call one. This has no, I mean, this thing does no work. It's just say, left's a problem, right's a problem. Right? So when we return from these two, uh, either one of these two calls, what do we know? That these guys are filled. Right? And then what do we do? We call the same merge with these things. And since at every step, it ends become smaller and smaller and smaller. Remember, we're shifting them by two. In about log n levels, we will be done. All right? We have anybody follow? No, it doesn't look like that. But that's all right. You have to contemplate this step. Now, how could we sort with this thing? It's really trivial, guys. It's really trivial. Now, let us write a sort which will use this merge to sort. And the only tricky thing in the entire thing is a trick of figuring out that the sort, which usually returns what? Sort usually returns void. I mean, what returns? Sorted this time. Here, we're going to return. Well, let's slide out. We're going to return an iterator. Because this is sort in place n. It's giving the beginning and the count. And we just say, guy, if somehow you're going to sort n guys, just return pointer past the end when you're done. Say, why do I need it? Oh, I don't need it. He needs it. Here is the idea to avoid doing all kind of advance and other stuff going far by making sort to compute what is needed for sort. This is very useful technique in general. Sort of this is probably the simplest way of introducing it. So first, we say that uh, when it's empty, we're done. Everybody agrees that it's really simple to sort an empty range. OK. So by the way, if it's one element, it's as easy as no element. We compute the half, and if it happens to be zero, meaning it was one, we return plus plus first. The, the end, we still need to do plus plus because it's not an empty range, it's one element range. So everybody agrees what with this thing. And then what we say that somehow, how do we get to the middle? Oh, we just call itself. and ask it to sort itself. Pardon me? Sort the first half. It somehow it sorts, we don't know how. Then it will sort the second half, we don't know how. But here we return middle, and here we return last. We need to return middle to call with the second thing. We need to return last, because that's what we're going to return. Well, and then finally, so the, here it's who does the work, because obviously nothing here does any work whatsoever. So that's what does the work. Because we say, if somehow by magic this is sorted, and this somehow by magic that is sorted, we could merge them together which we just wrote. And we just write this. And lo and behold, it actually works. Right, and show them that it works. There is a function called, let's look at it for a second, called sort.cpp. So 
So what it does, it random iota, uh, just make it smaller number, remove one of the ones. So random iota, we print it, we sort in place, we print it. Right? So here I going to wait. Does it compile? Oh, it does compile. It did, it, it did sort. Well, let me tell you, yesterday I spent basically a whole day chasing a stupidest possible bug because it didn't sort. And it's so stupid that I have to show it to you. Ryan, could you show them where the bug was? So that was uh, in this line. What I did, I used a powerful technique called control K, control Y, control Y to dupli duplicate this line. Then in my mind, I modified all these things. But I did it only in my mind. You know what was the amazing thing? It sorted all kind of arrays up to length 11. It and then it was sort of sorting bigger arrays, but not quite, which was utterly astonishing. And of course, I knew that there are no bugs in this code, because this code is just so self-evident. And I read it time and time again, and it was correct. It was doing this sub-problem and this sub-problem. Of course, I saw what wasn't there. So I had to instrument everything. I was rechecking binary search. It started at 9. I ended at about 3 o'clock. Well, at 2 o'clock, I was at the point of despair. That is, I knew that I have either to cancel the class or resign from my 9 or, you know, it's just dramatic things. Or actually, I seriously was thinking that we'll use the spoon. We'll write the code together. Maybe it will have no bug. So, it was, and then I, somehow I looked at the same place, and I saw it for the first time. But it was, you know, but programming is like that. And, you know, I always, with every bug, I go through this sort of, the sense of utter despair. But then, it, somehow, you, you find out the solution. It does work. So, now. I was planning to do a little bit even now with you guys, but I'll tell you what we will do in the next class. But sometime, like more enthusiastic students, like Hernan, who is absent, or Bert, who is here, might attempt to do it themselves. It's good. For other people, it's also good. Of course, other people have other things to do, but I would suggest so. It's a good algorithm, except it really sucks. Where does it suck? deep down at the tree. Right? We're doing this. If we do it on top, it's actually all right and it's good. Which is, and let me explain that. The idea is that what we can do, and that's what, what our plan is going to be, we're going to say, this, of course, uses no extra storage. But that's an excessive requirement. It's totally unrealistic. You have some extra storage someplace. You stashed it. Well, I mean, you know, it couldn't be that. So let's assume that you have this extra storage. Then you would start doing things differently. When your sub-problems, and this is why I want to teach it, because it's a general technique. When a sub-problem fits, solve it with a straightforward method which is just merge outside, or whatever, actually. What we will do, what, OK, I'm not going to tell you how. So use extra storage to merge. We will figure out how to merge fast. Otherwise, do this divide and conquer. So what you practically happens is that assume that you have 10% of the storage which is extra, which is a frequently the case. Right? It means that you will need only eight which is three, three levels of recursion for very big things. It doesn't matter. And then you will start using so, right? And we will be measuring that. So what, what I suggest is that you experiment with that if you could find time. Otherwise, we will do it in the class next time. 
because I want this problem to be done before Bjarne comes because it sort of will teach you one really nice algorithm which uses all kinds of things. Right. So this, this is, okay, we will learn th this kind of algorithms that we called memory adaptive algorithms. They adapt to how much memory as they're not in place, not strictly, not using any extra storage. By the way, this does use extra storage. How much extra storage does it use? Log, yes. Or it's again, it's a poly log. It might be log of log or something like that. Right. I'm referring to stack, yes. There are clearly no other memory yeah. used. Right? We, we didn't use any memory, but, but we're doing recursive calls. And, but we're balancing. We always balance, so we never do more than log n calls. Right? We're like dividing, dividing by two. Yes? All right? So we're getting to at least some end, and then we'll figure out what to do after Pierre's visit. See you in a week. <laughs>